You're listening to Ce n'est pas a Star Trek, a podcast where we review the Orville, Seth MacFarlane's high-spirited remix of Star Trek. I'm Skilltow. And this episode is Firestorm. Uh, phobia causes a lot of freeze in a crisis, so she has to explore her past and confront her fears about whether or not she's good enough to be the Orville's head of security. Also, there are clowns. Her big issue here is overcoming a fear pretty similar to the one Wesley has to overcome in Coming of Age in TNG. Yeah, yeah. Um, it reminded me of a different Crusher story with Dr. Crusher in that Dr. Crusher gets pulled into a static warp bubble, which brings all her fears to life. Well, one fear. So she's trapped in this mad universe that she's trying to make sense of. Um, and she eventually has to escape from it. Yeah, exploring pocket universes is a common thing in Star Trek, and explorers from another one in DS9 make sort of a fear field where people's fears become real in DS9's episode, If Wishes Were Horses. I thought they just did, like, whatever their imagination said. Was it just fears? It, it, no, it was okay. everything. Anything they thought of, anything they were mm -hmm. thinking about. But that happened to involve a lot okay. of scary things. Um or one big scary thing. I was about to say, yeah, no, I, I forgot the A plot for that is the exact same thing, murdering everyone. Um, <laughs> so the Voyager episode Thaw was really explicit. It's also got Michael McKean in it, who is who is amazing. But they find a colony that was wiped out by a solar flare or whatever, and they hid inside of a mini matrix, which had a program designed to keep their brains active and fed on the neural signals, and it made like a fear dude, and the fear dude was torturing them as part of its existence. Um, and so again, you have another kind of reality with no rules where anything happens. Explicitly fear-related, very much like this episode. Yeah, it's neat how that fear character was an emergent property of the system. <laughs> yeah. And this, yeah, this episode is kind of a, I'm not going to call it an emergent property, but it's a thing that happens because the Orville is what the Orville is. It's a remix of Star Trek. And I feel like they took a, uh, when they were plotting out all of the themes and events they would take from Star Trek, some of them just don't quite fit. And I feel like they dumped a bunch of these into a Halloween episode because it's not exactly in the real continuity taking place entirely on the holodeck. Yeah, that's... I like the shift in tone. I think Star Trek has done some fairly tense, scary you know, mystery stories where uh, the one with the bluegills, right? Conspiracy, where there's little aliens taking over people's brains in the back of their necks and making them do conspiracy stuff is, is kind of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, right? Yeah, and that's always a favorite. I'm still sad there isn't a Admiral, Admiral exploded <laughs> ribcage of, what's his name? Uh, Rimmick. It is a departure for, for this show. It is pretty dark pretty and pretty serious. And they do a good job of undercutting that with just constant jokes. It makes me wonder if they had more fun writing this, or if because it was just off the wall, every element, they just... Yeah, it feels uh, super polished in terms of the comedy. The comedy sockets into a serious, um, you know, space mystery episode really well throughout. Uh, I, was, I mean, it's, it's always been a funny show, but they do it really well here. Oh, and they start off in the middle of action, which is also pretty unusual for the Orville. Usually they're just going about their business and then something happens or they get orders or something. But here they're in the middle of a storm. I could swear we've seen an engineering scene where stuff falls on people before. I, I could just be misremembering generic. <laughs> we've seen Isaac collapse. be forcefully propelled into things before. And it's interesting because this is a show that takes for granted all of the, the general sci-fi knowledge we have from Star Trek including the ensemble and this is a pretty good um ensemble episode it's it's a lot of focus but everybody gets a little time in here especially when it comes to their fears i really enjoy that people's fears go after different people like whoever's fear of heights uh, i think fence said she had a fear of heights but we get yeah. grayson ends up falling through picard's door to nowhere <laughs> yeah and then the bugs uh the arachnophobia that's um the giant cgi monsters who go and eat malloy when we realize that the episode's not actually doing anything 
Yeah, that, that's the one that kind of breaks the episode for you. But I hope we see more of Mercer's arachnophobia later. He's a fairly central character, and arachnophobia seems pretty common. That would be nice if we get... Uh, if this episode also contains foreshadowing, in addition to being built out of stuff. <laughs> the fear of surgery is a callback to Malloy's practical joke, or Isaac cutting his leg off, of course. <laughs> yeah, that was in... And Grayson's fear of isolation that we get into at the end, adopted, of course, from Dr. Crusher and Remember Me. That's... An interesting part of the character we could explore later. Oh, yeah. Totally. But I feel like this episode, a lot of these things are out of the ordinary for Star Trek. In Next Generation, when that ex-prisoner guy basically <laughs> sabotages the Enterprise and tops all the members of the crew in security. Roga Dinar. Tops is an interesting verb. Yeah. But yeah, Roga Dinar in The Hunted. Here he's turned into a clown. <laughs> That's fun. But, you know, if I was aboard us, our Cleon analog, I would not want to be in that cargo bay ever. Cargo bays are dangerous, yo. Another one where the ship gets taken over. So I think what this episode is doing is that anything that gets dumped into this or any of the themes or like kinds of events are things that aren't going to happen. So like the giant spider running down the hallway, I don't think we're going to get Barclay turning into a spider here or giant viruses from Voyager creeping out of the computer networks yeah. or even the CGI Tholians and Gorn from Enterprise. Maybe. I, I don't think we've gotten there yet. I think they've established the Orville as kind of a safe place. I think they can change that. I don't think that's a given. I think it's just a rule they can break later. Well, sure. I mean, Batman the Animated Series, they started out the show saying they were never going to show Batman's origin. But after, like, two or three seasons, they actually got around <laughs> Doesn't to Doesn't surprise it. me. But I mean, you're laying out the base yeah. rules of the show. For instance, I think we probably are not going to see the holodeck run amok every season. I don't think we're going to see uh, Moriarty taking over the ship. Troop subverted. Uh, um, I don't think the holodeck does run amok in this series. We, we construct a very, very strange scenario in which <laughs> the holodeck has not technically run amok. We've just erased someone's memory and right. used a command protocol to run the holodeck amok. Under, under strength Strict control. Under strict control. The holodeck is not trying to take over the ship. This is just somebody yeah. misusing the holodeck. Which is fair, and I totally expect to see. Oh yeah, so there's a couple... Like, someone suggests that the ship is haunted, or they almost suggest the ship is haunted. And the doctor, I don't know what's going on with her in the medical bay. Is she possessed by Red Jack? <laughs> is she the evil doctor from Voyager. I mean, she's just she's just playing through the necessary components to make Malloy's phobia right. In that we live in a community right. of interdependent specialists. I think it's natural to fear a failure of certain portions of that. And that involves um, the fear of trusting other people. You know, every day with our health, with our safety, with, you know, the antimatter regulators, with immunity shots, with this and that. You know, going back to coming of age, the episode of TNG, Wesley has a great moment with Worf there, where Worf is like, yeah, I'm afraid of stuff. I'm afraid of trusting people with my life every day. Wesley's like, wow, how'd you get over that? And Worf is like, I didn't. I just I just suck it up because <laughs> Cleons are great, good, big on mental health. Oh, that's that's a neat callback here with uh, Bordas being afraid of Isaac. Yeah, yeah. Also point out that uh, Worf also happens to be afraid of clicking aliens from beyond space, chaining him to a medical table and doing unwanted surgery on him. <laughs> I mean, that's just experience, though. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, um, that's a good point, actually, with Lara betraying that trust by undertaking the simulation. Because the people can't rely on her if she's going to do things like this. Yeah. Long-running interpersonal rifts seem to be against the ethos of the show. So I do not think we're going to be seeing a lot of betrayal. Obviously, a lot of the character arcs don't have any obvious signs of, like, sleeper agents or anything. Or the ship. I think what this show could do is to conveniently ignore it, because that's funny, and then just bring it up when it's hilarious again. So just say, you know, I've always been a reliable security agent. Like, well, what about that time that you <laughs> gave yourself amnesia and made the holodeck try to kill you? And she's like, okay, one time. You know, so then they can bring it back up and you would be like, hey, remember that one time of the thing? And then everyone can kind of laugh about it. One thing I noticed here is that out of all the stuff they throw into this, they didn't throw any telepathy or psychic powers or actual haunting. Their theory of what was wrong with the ship was that it was basically haunted by something in the storm, and they were going to fly back into the storm and hope that it got rid of it. That's There's an episode in the first season of Next Generation and from the animated series where they do that too. Yeah, that was a pretty stupid plan. But there's no actual telepaths or psychic powers. Yeah. And I'm not sure if they're saving that for next season, like... Uh, something to do with the souls of the krill 
<laughs> or if that's just going to get dumped into the next uh, Halloween episode again. I I don't like telepathy. I've called it space magic on many occasions. Yeah, you really need like rigorous rules for how it works in order for it to actually play well. Right. The binars in the next generation had implicitly had radio telepathy. They connected with each other, but it was assumed that it was because of their cybernetic enhancements. I would accept that. I would accept, like Andorians, they have antennas, so they can detect EM fields and maybe put them out. I don't know. Like, that works for me. A little bit of science there. Um, I absolutely hate ghouls and goblins in TV shows. They're like, ooh, maybe... I did like the original series. Uh, whichever one, they had the giant black cat and the two witches from another galaxy. Oh. Not because it was particularly good or executed well, <laughs> but because they had, when they blew a hole in the floor, the roof of something, yeah. they didn't have an actual hole. It was just like the idea of a hole. And that's mm. just a really good element I like from that. Yeah, <laughs> that was also a Halloween episode. So I guess that yep. probably should have been one of our first go-tos. But yeah. I like that they explained that in terms of like, this is just really advanced technology. And there was a whole story about that, like people from higher beings who weren't what they appeared to be and illusion and power and human foibles and all that kind of stuff which they do sort of do in this episode with all of the crazy stuff turning out to be the holodeck yeah i can kind of see that i really hate gray's anatomy and i've seen some episodes because i'm a good friend and there's an episode where like gray is dying and like her mom is also dying and then like she sees her mom in like her near-death vision and like that's bullshit and then fuck that it's like have a science show or don't you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is not a science show. It should be. It should be a science show, damn it. Well, this episode probably should have been a, more of a mystery episode, if they were building it seriously. Instead of just the moment a real mystery rears its head, they kill off Malloy and then show you, like, five minutes later what's actually going on. Yeah, and at least at least there's a short pause between there, because once, once Malloy gets eaten, you're like, oh, none of this is real. Like, the doctor can be a little crazy, and they can fix her. You can even leave Nurse Park as dead. Like, that's a big step, but he's a supporting character. We'll get over it. But once Gordon dies, you're like, okay, this isn't, something's happening. She, she's in a war bubble or whatever. And and they don't they don't jerk us around between that point and the time where they tell us that it's, it's a holodeck thing. And yeah, there's, so. if I can refer to yet two more other tv shows here why would we stop now finale of uh like the first or second season of capaldi's doctor who where they make him president of earth versus the series finale of grim both <laughs> Wait, of those I'm use I'm like sorry. uh dream logic president of episode. earth president of earth okay <laughs> they just decide to give him emergency powers because he takes authority anyway in a crisis god Damn fucking Moffat. Please continue. Right, but that's my point. That episode, or the two-parter, whatever, runs completely on dream logic. If you're watching the episode seriously, there's never a point in it where a Molloy dies and you say, okay, this has to be a dream. But the way it's written, you have to question everything that happens. It builds up to the point where you think it's a dream, or I thought it was a dream, <laughs> but it's not. They went... They decided to keep it as the genuine continuity, which was just insane. They shouldn't have done that. But Finale of Grimm, they did it exactly the same way. They never had a Molloy getting eaten moment, but it was all dream logic, and it did turn out to be a dream. They're not jerking us around, but they give us enough to realize it's a dream and feel smart about figuring out it's a dream. And then they have more plot that about it being a dream. There is some payoff for it being a dream. It isn't just an event that happens. There's an actual payoff for it. Like, we can engage with it. Yeah. Why is this so weird? Oh, maybe it's not real. And therefore, we there's a mystery there to some extent, and we've solved it. There, yeah, there's subtext. There's something else to interact with once you realize it's a dream. It isn't mm -hmm. just that everything's reversible. Right. So it's not... M. Night Shyamalan is making movies again. We we didn't oh, really? we didn't put a stake through his heart. And the thing about his movies is that there are clues, um, little things you can see at the edge, right? Like people always ask, "Oh, what if we're in the Matrix? What if we're just in a holodeck?" Well, if you can't see the little edges, if you can't see the little faults in it, it doesn't matter because you can't get out. But if you construct a false scenario, if in the story we're gonna find our way out then you need to put those clues in there. You need to fray the edges a little bit. And then we put the clues together and we get out. And that did not happen to Alara in this episode. Yeah. Is that bad? Um, I guess it depends on how much uh, storytelling space they had and how much they wanted to do with it. We said earlier that the episode was pretty tight. 
and well packed with humor and i think mm. it was really well packed with star trek references which i take for granted yeah. is a secondary goal of this series yeah we usually stop in the first two or three minutes we've been going for the whole episode <laughs> sometimes it goes line by line yeah do we need the mystery I think it would have it would have been improved, I think, by having a mystery, but I don't think this specific episode required it. Yeah, because my when we started this project, we went down for each episode and entered a one to ten score for each episode as we remembered it before we rewatched it, and then we created normalized scores and compared those to see where we might conflict, where we could get, you know, content out of the conflict. In this episode, I ranked really low. And then I watched it, and I ranked it really high. You know, mysteries are kind of boring once you watch them the second time. You know the mystery. Like, you watch it, mystery happens, you're engaged trying to put the clues together. You watch it a second time, you're like, oh, look, the clues, how oh, they all fit together. Isn't this a good story? Right. And then you don't watch it a third time, because who gives a shit the third time? Right. But this episode's consistently fun. Yeah, that's... I hadn't considered that, reversing the two questions. Like, if this had been written as a mystery it would have needed all of the elements that are here in order to be rewatchable. I wonder how much the series is being written for rewatchability as opposed to like high quality for a first viewing. I don't know. I, Or I should say, I wonder how aware the writers are that they could be writing for high rewatchability as opposed to high quality first viewing. Yeah, that, that's a whole thing to dissect. Like when you're making a TV show now, like how much do you weigh replayability? How much do you weigh cutscenes? How much do you weigh, is this gifable? You know, I it's it's really interesting. Oh wow, yeah. You know, can you make a scene, words, and an actor go in such a way that they represent something so fundamental that someone could gift that and put that on the internet and it becomes part of the lingua franca of the internet, which is animated gifs. But that's it's besides this. Well, sort of, because the all of the good animated gifs are usually people expressing some kind of emotion, like Picard, the double face palm or the face palm. So as long as people are emoting throughout, there's a lot of good, I'm not going to say emotional scenes, but there's a lot of good reactions throughout this episode. While we're talking about the great things I like, when she's fighting with Isaac in the shuttle bay, there's a part where she kicks him and he just jingas out one of a mini crates and the rest of them just fall down and then fall over. But it's just like a great visual. Uh, I really like that. It was a good visual and I wanted to, I'm very critical of this show. Sure, sure. That's. I'm so, wondering how they did with the physics of it, because that sounds like they did it correctly for heavy crates and something heavy getting kicked through them. Yeah. But again, it's just a little bit, and the fight scenes here were good. You know, story story issues notwithstanding, but this isn't a mystery, and therefore when I watched it the second time, I was free to immerse myself in the apparent story that was happening with Alara in the ship, and not trying to engage in some mystery, and I enjoyed it more, which is a really weird experience. Yeah. So do you still think it was trying to be written as a mystery? Have you changed your mind on that? I, I don't know their intent. Fair. Yeah, I just watched Star Trek's The Best of Both Worlds today, and in talking about it, I said maybe Commander Shelby is an advanced character written to be a strong, respectable woman who has an antagonist relationship with Riker. And then the Admiral goes, if I was a few years younger, well, <laughs> you're like, God damn it, writers. <laughs> I trusted you for a second. So I try not to guess too much what writers are going We can through. let our guard down, even for a second. I know we can't. <laughs> I think this episode raises unintentionally a lot of questions about, does it matter if the story is real within the universe of the story? Alara had suddenly run into some phenomena which gave the crew brain parasites that made their fears come to life or whatever. And this was right after a guy died because she was afraid. Is that any more contrived than she goes into the holodeck with a memory eraser to confront her fears? One of those is a common plot. They have X problem in their personal life. Oh, look, we're on a mission where X is related to the mission. Well, uh, and we just accept that. Uh, have you seen Supernatural? Yeah. That is the basic... I've seen some of Supernatural. That is their, uh, I guess, their ad libs for writing a Supernatural script. When it's done too transparently, it does get kind of tedious. <laughs> I mean, my example is best of both worlds again. Riker's passing up a command. The Borg are attacking. Is Riker ready to take command or not? Oh, gosh, we don't know. The Borg kidnap Captain Picard. Riker's in command. He makes a big command decision. There's two parallel plots there. By coincidence, they're related. That's a contrivance. That should strain our, our sense of suspension of disbelief. Agreed. But it's good storytelling. Yes. I assume Supernatural does the same thing? Most, usually a lot less artfully, if you could believe that. 
Yeah, you know, if you can't do it artfully, maybe just make a fucking holodeck episode yeah. and be honest with us about that. It's best if you can yeah. have the plots grow organically, like the personal crisis is triggered by the event that mirrors it, or vice versa. Yeah. As to whether a fake plot and fake events have the same weight, I think that really depends on, again, the relationships between the characters, whether that's developed, explored, or interacted with at all like here it's just alara running through a holodeck on her own yeah there's we get a little bit of interaction with the other characters at the beginning and at the end so if there had been like if alara did anything about a crush on another member of the crew or if i don't know isaac had decided that malloy and uh, lamar would get into a duel to the death over something that wouldn't carry any weight because it's not actual characters doing anything so i guess in that Alara is the one who has obstacles to overcome, and it's real for Alara. We accept that that something has happened, that Alara has overcome something. Yeah. And even if it's not the story that Isaac wrote, you know, it would be the story that some neckbeard in Los Angeles wrote. So maybe maybe that distinction isn't as, as clear as I would, as I had originally expected going into the rewatch of this episode. I do want to see a so. mystery episode, kind of like this. Uh, since this was a bottle episode framed as a career crisis for Alara, All right. I'd like to see, you see next Halloween's bottle episode center on a Lamar relationship crisis, like something to do with him and Finn's kids or something. Yeah, yeah. Generally make it yeah. like our man Bashir, but kind of blow decks featuring the secondary cast like uh, Yafit, Clyden, and Finn's kids, Nurse Park, bring back the retired chief engineer. Him being around would be a good clue that things aren't real. <laughs> right so and then uh heavy use of psychic and magic powers since that's a staple of original series uh halloween episodes that didn't get tossed into this one maybe you have the main cast diving into lamar's head and then like this yeah. episode had people uh nominating phobias to get programmed into a lot of simulation these people all get embodied as a different member of the secondary cast make bordis the smallest of finn's kids <laughs> One, the comedic potential in having supporting cast members with the voices of main cast members is great. I think also you can have them live their life in the world that Lamar perceives. So you can have, say, Malloy, you know, slurping around as Yafit and kind of seeing how other people see Malloy. You can have Bordas see his, his marital strife from like a third perspective. And say like, oh wow, is this how Lamar sees other people seeing us? A Lara who always seems to not get that she's good enough. I mean, she's young and she has a lot to prove. But to see people looking at her and saying, yeah, a Lara makes me feel safer. Or Isaac just seeing a, a version of people's, a perspective of the crew that he doesn't get to see because of how they react to him. That's yeah, a good opportunity for a lot of character development. And... It's a great idea, but I just want to seize on one very small part of what you said. Getting to see things from other characters' perspective, if they had someone going around as Yafit, <laughs> you could have a bunch of the episode just as like this uh, green tint with a slight <laughs> undulation across the screen. So you never yeah. have to like actually animate Yafit. You just put a filter on. Yeah, a filter with a low camera angle. That'd be great. <laughs> and you know who it is. So yeah, no, I, I think that'd be a pretty interesting episode. Maybe we will see something like that in season two. Yeah, maybe. So uh, until then, until then.